Welcome this afternoon um, to my second lecture today, which is called How to Add Space Without Extending. Now, those of you who are expecting David Blaine and a magic show, well, I'm sorry, be disappointed. Um, this is uh, not about trickery, it is about the genuine art of making the very most of the space you've got and in some cases using it in such a way that you actually increase the space available and I will go into that in more case. My name is Hugo Tugman, I'm the founder of an uh, organisation called Architect Your Home. We are a national network of architects who specialise in homeowner projects um, and as such I have done loads and loads and loads and loads of homeowner projects over the years. And the one thing that is common to practically everybody, practically every home I've been into, practically every homeowner I've seen, is that they want more space. Just to make sure we're in the right place, who here would like more space in their home? Me! Yes, everybody. Good, you're in the right place. This is about how to get the maximum out of the space you've got and possibly even add to that space without extending. Um, I write for Real, Ho Real Homes magazine, which is the capacity I'm in here officially. Um, I also wrote a book, and it is traditional and important to give a shameless plug for your book at events like this. So this is my book, it's called Architect Your Home. Easy to remember, it's the same name as my company. Um, and a lot of the images I'm going to show you of projects we completed are in the book. So, how to add space without extending. I am going to give you my 10 top tips, it's only a brief half hour um, lecture, my 10 top tips on how to add space to your home without extending. So without further ado, tip number one is look at the space in plan. Imagine you're potentially buying a new flat or a new house and you walk into it and it's, it's, a, it's a mess, it's jumbled up with people's stuff, there's cupboards, there's doors, there's stairs, there's windows. There's all these various things and you think, well, I know this could be better, but I can't see how. I can't imagine how I can, I can actually change this. It's so hard to get a sense of it. Look at it in plan. The first thing that I would do if I went into somebody's house is I would throw a tape measure around. I wouldn't necessarily go to a huge amount of detail, but I would throw a tape measure around um, and produce what I call a measured survey. This is a very basic sketch measured survey of the ground floor of a house you can see doors in here, a porch up the, the tops and stairs, an office, a kitchen, a utility room. I've shown the thickness of the walls, but it helps me get a sense, rather than just walking in and seeing doors and stuff, I have a sense of how the different rooms are arranged together. I then would lay a piece of uh, tracing paper over the top of that, and I might draw how it might be. So I'm starting to work between the existing and the proposed, um, working out different things. So, the art of these things is to, is, to, uh, is to work it over and over again. Typically for a house, in terms of working out a new layout, I might overlay paper five, maybe 10, maybe 15 or 20 times. Every idea you have, draw it. It's always worth it. Don't just think, oh, well, that might, that, that, it'd be quite good if we put the door around here. Draw it. It'd be quite good if we said, draw it. If you draw it, then you can see, very often, even an idea that you think isn't very promising, oh, I wonder if that would work. Draw it. Actually, it works really well, better than I thought. Or something that sounds really promising, you draw it, oh, and it doesn't really work because I hadn't thought about how that connects with there. Until it's drawn in, drawn on, in paper, you haven't got a chance. So, so number one tip, work in plan. I often refer to solving these projects a bit like a Rubik's Cube. Remember those Rubik's Cubes? We used to turn them and try and get all the colours on the same side. Of the, of the cube, because you draw, for example, the ground floor plan and you've moved the staircase and then you go upstairs to the first floor plan and you realise that it completely doesn't work, so you do that and then you mess up the ground floor plan. You go back and you go forward and you go back and you go forward and you work over and eventually you get to the right harmonious solution. Don't expect it to happen five minutes. It doesn't happen in five minutes. It takes time to work over and over, but work in plan. Once you've um, worked in plan in this way, one of the best, most important first steps is to have a measured survey done. This is a typical uh, measured survey done by a land surveyor. This is basically just a very accurate version of what I showed you in the first slide. This has been done with these guys who've got sort of laser, gu laser guided weapons to zip, 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 and, and into the computer and bang, 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 bang. And um, 
a little while later, out comes a drawing like this that gives you all of the ceiling heights and head heights and everything, but the wall thicknesses are absolutely right. So you know exactly what you've got. Very important to have drawings of what you've got before you start talking about what you might do. Tip number two, look for the space that's not working hard for you. Particularly if we're living, particularly in London, but I know all over the country to a, to a, to a great extent as well, it's very important that your space, which often is very limited, is working as hard as it possibly can for you. This doesn't mean to say that every millimeter has to have something going on. It might be that that bit of space is contributing to the overall sense of space. But make sure it's doing the best it can for you. Corridor spaces very often aren't working very hard. Hallway spaces very often aren't working very hard. Under stair spaces very often aren't working very hard. See how you can get these spaces to work as well as possible. Now this photograph shows a kitchen um, of a house before we got involved. I will confess this is actually two photographs laying over the top of each other. It's not that um, this is some sort of weird deconstructivist house. It actually is two completely separate photographs of a kitchen but I couldn't fit them both on the one side. As you can see, there's a um, perfectly adequate kitchen with a slightly old-fashioned honeycomb style floor and a rather hacienda style archway and a little window. It's all right. It's not great. It's okay. It's not working very hard for the customer though. This exact same space we changed into that. The archway used to come over here and down here. The little window is now a, a set of French doors. There's a kitchen island in the front. There's a, two new windows here. Now the space is working really hard for the customer and they've got a lovely, lovely kitchen. They've got a space for a breakfast area. It all works beautifully. This is a, uh, a flat in Chelsea. And this was the little kitchen area. Um, again, tiling's a bit old fashioned. Some of the units are a bit old fashioned, a bit grubby. Um, you go through a doorway into this other space. There's that shelving unit, another doorway. There's doors all over the place, corridor space. It doesn't really work very well, doesn't really work very hard. It all feels a bit cramped and claustrophobic. That same space reworked, and I'm sorry if it's a bit bleached out on here. You might be able to see better on the TV screen. Uh, it's much, much more open, much more connected, much more thought through. The space is working much, much harder for the owner of this house or this flat. This is a nice little project that I uh, did many, many years ago. This was a studio flat, and apart from the little tiny bathroom, the total living accommodation was slightly less than six metres long and slightly less than four metres wide. And it involved kitchen, living, sleeping, everything. Now in this room, you can see there's a bed here in the corner. There's the entrance door from the common uh, parts of the, of the flat building. And you come in and we built a little kitchen. We did a uh, bespoke uh, hob top at the end of this kitchen. We curved the end of it so to create the space or the center space as you come into the flat. You can see here some more detail of the kitchen. Everything's here. It's only small, but it's all included. We've got three electric rings. Underneath, we've got storage. We've got a chopping board, sink, drainer, place for a kettle. The TV is on a, on a bracket on the wall. We've got a washing machine, a drawer for cutlery, a combination oven microwave, and above that a cupboard in which the boiler sat. Lots and lots of uh, elements, all the elements that you'd need in a flat. Really, really compact because it's such a small flat, but working in a very nice way. Lots of detail, lots of thought about the design. Really quite elegant um, space. And there's a space at the other side for a little dining table next to the window. Worked really beautifully. The flat, this let's say just less than four and just less than six, 23 odd square meters, working very, very hard for this person. There was in fact one little detail that, that that drawer there, in fact, was a little flap that opened and you had a pull out, fold out ironing board, which was getting really, really James Bondy. I actually, I don't know if James Bond ever did any ironing. Never saw him do it. Anyway, the third tip, convert underused spaces. If you've got some space that isn't really used very well, very cost-effective way of finding more space in your home is to convert it into really usable space. Obvious choices are a loft. So this, again, very bleached out here, might see better on the screen there. This photograph of a, a loft space hasn't been extended, no dormer or anything like that. We've simply occupied a loft space that was previously a dusty place where suitcases were kept. 
and we have uh, fitted it out as a nice bedroom with an ensuite bathroom at the end. We've done some clever storage arrangements that pull out from behind the bathroom wall. And again, on this side, a shelving and more storage in the lower areas. So making best use of all the low areas for storage and best use of the high areas for actually making it a nice bedroom. This is slightly going beyond the remit of this talk, being how to increase space without extending, because it does involve a certain amount of extension. This was a house in West London, very standard type of house, um, with a garage built onto the side of it. They didn't really ever use the garage, apart from it being cluttered up with loads of junk. So we converted the garage. We did actually also, while we were at it, extend the first floor as well. But if you can see the porch, if I can just go back, the porch and the front door and the garage has been changed. So you've got the porch front door extended. Um, and that now is a study room at the front and in larger part of the kitchen at the back. So um, very much enlarging using the space that they had, although admittedly on the first floor there was an extension too. Fourth tip, don't be afraid of structure. I hear so many people saying, well, I was thinking about enlarging this, but I was thinking about reworking this, but I can't touch that because that's a structural wall. Can't touch that because that's a load-bearing wall. Don't be afraid. It's absolutely fine. That doesn't mean to say that it's perfectly all right to go home and get a sledgehammer and knock down this structural wall that's in the middle of your house because your house will probably fall down if you do. What I'm saying is, with the advice of a structural engineer, usually a fairly modest steel beam, it's not a big deal to make an opening in a load-bearing or structural wall. Also, if you knock a wall and it goes boom, 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 and you knock another wall and it goes boom, 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 and you think, oh, well, this one's not structural because it's hollow. That's not necessarily true. You do have stud walls that are structural. You do have brick walls which are non-structural. It's a little bit more complicated than the knocking on it test. Don't be afraid of structure. Knocking through structural walls can really enhance the sense of space in a, in a house. In this particular case, We've got a lovely front room and a back room. We've done some work at the back there with a double height space and a balcony. But what I wanted to show here was the enlargement of the space, the south facing garden, um, the daylight coming into the garden, coming through into the front room that was previously really cut off. So that knocking through has really enhanced the sense of space. Similarly, in this example, we have what was three rooms knocked through to create a living space. A dining, a dining kitchen, breakfast space, and a hallway space, all interconnected by this knocking through of structural walls. It's not a big deal. How much does it cost to knock through an opening between two rooms in a structural wall? Well, making a hole is very cheap. It's not an expensive thing to do. Making a hole in a wall doesn't cost very much at all. Making a hole with a wall, putting a beam in, costs a little bit more, but still not very much. The cost in fact, is in all the replasterboarding and replastering and making sure the floor finishes and moving the radiator and all of it and redecorating and skirting boards and moving light switches and all of those various things. Doesn't matter whether the wall's structural or not, all of those costs will still apply. The fact that it's a load bearing wall doesn't make it significantly more expensive to move than if it's a non load bearing wall. So don't be afraid of structure. Tip number five.